Okay, good morning everyone. Um, I hope you are awake already. Kalau mengantuk lagi, get some water ke apa ke. So today we are doing chapter 5. We already finished our chapter 4 and your web assign is already up for chapter 4. Uh, it is due next week on Saturday. But of course, jangan tunggu last minute and then baru nak buat. So please try to do it uh, sikit, sikit lah, okay? So we are doing chapter 5. Chapter 5 is on linear momentum and for linear momentum, we will be learning about impulse and momentum, conservation of linear momentum and also collision. I would say chapter 5 is fairly shorter than chapter 4 uh, and I think it's easier to go. Okay, so the learning outcomes that we are expecting out of this chapter is to know how to calculate impulse and momentum. We need to state the impulse momentum theorem. So this is going to be on the exam. Kalau don't tell you theorem lah of chapter five. State the conservation of linear momentum and then solve problems related to collisions. So for this chapter, kita akan belajar what happens when two objects collide, what is preserved and what is not preserved ataupun conserved. Okay. So um, the first thing that I want to introduce to you guys is called the impulsive force. So it's a type of force that happens when we have an impact. So um, let's say, okay, I, I want to show you guys a video. Let me pause. Eh, resume. How do I pause recording? Resume. Okay. Yes, that's depressing. We all know eggs cry when it's thrown from balcony. Have you ever wondered why? What would happen if that was a human? Is there a way to prevent it? All these questions shall be answered in just a second. If a human gets thrown on the balcony, they will die. Or they will get seriously injured. The reason why the egg cries and why we get injured can be explained by impulse force related to the concept of momentum and primarily based on Newton's second law. What is impulse force? And Newton's second law, you ask? I will leave the explanation to the others. Newton's second law of motion states that the change in momentum of an object divides by the elapsed time is equal to the constant net force acting on the object, and it can be represented by this formula. Where the net force, also known as the impulse force acting on the object, is F, the change in momentum is mv minus mu, and the t represents the time taken for the change in momentum to occur. As you can see from this equation, where the time taken for the change in momentum increase, the values of impulse force decrease, and vice versa. An example of impulse force that you probably have experienced before is when you dive into bed. Diving into bed doesn't hurt. I'm okay. But dive into the ground is terribly painful. Ugh. Why? The bed is soft and eases you as you fall, extending the time taken for the change in momentum to occur, resulting in less impulse force being acted upon you. Less force means less pain. In the comparison, the ground will stop you immediately. This means that the time taken for the change in momentum to occur is really short and it causes a large impulse force to act on you. Okay, so back to this uh, explanation. So they are comparing between two uh, situations. One is uh, the student jumping on the bed, and when he jumps on the bed, the impact between him and the bed, the time taken for him to collide with the bed is, um, when he collides with the bed, he is not stopped immediately, but he has some buffering time. So that buffering time when he touches the bed and they tak stop lagi when he touches the bed, that time when he before he stops is longer than when he collides with a floor. Kalau dia langgar floor, dia terus stop kan? Kalau langgar bed, ada masa sebelum dia stop. So that masa tu mengurangkan impact force tu. Sorry, impulsive force. 
Okay, let's continue. Was forced to act on you. Egbert was simply because it couldn't withstand the impulse force acting upon it. The answer to preventing the egg from cracking can be found in the back example. Yes, the solution is quite simple. Give the egg a bed to jump into or find a way to ease the falling objects when they hit the ground. This can be achieved by wrapping towels around the egg. The towels serve as padding for the egg, increasing the time taken for change in momentum to take place. Since the reasoning for why eggs crack are the exact same as to why we suffer injuries from not just falling but from collisions in general, the solution is the same too. When we fall or crash into objects, safety equipment such as helmets, knee pads, airbag, and landing mats serve as our towels, increasing the time and decreasing the impulse force. So, always remember to use proper equipment when exercising because, after all, our bodies are only as fragile as an egg. Thank you, New Christina, and Nora Ariza for working on this. And here is the credits. Okay. Let's continue. Okay, so that was a um, demonstration on impulsive force. So we saw that if we extended the time of two objects colliding, we could reduce the force acting on the object. And uh, it serves as a padding if the, how do I say this? When we have a longer time, the impulsive force decreases. Lah, okay, so I'm going to stop at that and stop trying to explain it because it's hard. So in practice, the force that acts on the object is time varying force over the interval. The impulsive force is equivalent to average constant force over the time interval. So you have this. This is the impulsive force. And uh, since this is a varying force, we typically say, okay, so this area of the force is the same as this area of box. So we just say, okay, so the F average times with the time is our impulsive force. So we actually approximate this to be an F average, but this is not how it looks like. The way it looks like is actually this way. Okay, let me repeat that. So this equation gives us equation F average times with the time taken for the collision, and this is equal to impulse. This is the approximation for the force acting on the object. So it would look like this. F average is an average force. But in reality, there is a spike in the force like this. And it is called a varying force. But it is hard for us to put it into this equation. So we approximate it as a box. How do we approximate it? The area between these two guys must be equal. So this is area one, the whole thing, right? And this is area two, they are equal. So this is the only way that this works. The area needs to be the same. Okay, so this is the first equation that we need to know. F times T is equal to impulse. And F is the impulsive force. In a force time graph, the impulse is equivalent to the area under the graph. So F times T gives you impulse the area under the curve is FT, right? So that is your impulse. The impulse of this guy is the same as the impulse of the box. So this is our approximation. So the one in pink is the same as the hot pink. Okay, so it's the equal. Okay, next. So impulse is defined as the product of the average force delivered to the no object normally in a very short time. So we've seen that example just now, we, sh we know that the collision at the point the collide between the two objects is very, very short. And the way to minimize that impact is to extend the time. So the SI unit for impulse is kilogram. This guy is in, why am I using crayon? This guy is in, uh, we know that this is Newton or kilogram meter per second squared because it is F equals to MA. M is kilogram, A is meter per second squared. This is T, or we can say this is Newton and second, Newton second. This is two, acceleration. F equals to, F is a kilogram meter per second squared. And Newton second, both uh, are acceptable. Eh? So impulse punya XI unit is Newton second or kilogram meter per second squared. 
Okay, so now we're going into momentum. Kita dah belajar pasal baru briefly lah kita belajar pasal impulse and impulsive force. Impulse is F T. Impulsive force is the F inside the equation of F T. Okay, let me write that down. So impulse is F T, or you can write it as I F in F T. This guy is the impulsive force. Okay, so the name tu lebih kurang kan? This is impulse. This is impulsive force. Okay, so I equals to F T. All right. So now we're moving on to momentum. Momentum is we know this already from chapter two, I think chapter two. We we talked about law of inertia, right? So law of inertia says that uh, it is the tendency of an object to move um, unless acted on by a force. And the way to quantify the law of inertia is by using the momentum equation. And we learned that momentum P is equal to MV. So this is what we learned last time. This is the way to quantify inertia. So the momentum for the common meaning of momentum is the tendency of body to continue in motion or just inertia is the same thing, almost the same thing. And for the physics definition, the quantity to measure the tendency to oppose the change of motion. So this is the quantity that we need to know to oppose the change of motion. The quantity that we need to know to know how much to oppose the change of motion. Okay, so P equals to MV is momentum. It is a vector quantity. Oh, I already forgot to, te to, to, to tell you. Kenapa saya stuttering today? I forgot to tell you that this is also a vector quantity. This guy, it has that symbol. Remember, it's a vector quantity if we have that topi kat atas, or we have that half arrow, or we have that small arrow on our uh, on our term here. So this is a vector quantity. Impulse is a vector quantity. Momentum is also a vector quantity. Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. Mass is a scalar. But velocity is a vector, so this guy follows the velocity. The vector direction depends on the velocity. So the SI unit is, this guy is kilogram, and this is meter per second, or Newton second. Oh, saya silap something tadi. Guys, kenapa tak tegur saya? Tadi saya cakap ni S. So this cancels out. Minus one. So betul lah. Saya yang tengah. <laughs> tak betul. So this is kilogram meter per second. Eh? Because this guy force is kilogram meter per second squared. When you times it with time, which is second, cancel out. Okay, so you get kilogram meter per second. Uh, everyone is still not awake like me. Come on guys, wake up. We need to wake up to learn this. Okay, <clears throat> so the SI unit is the same as impulse. So FT is equal to I. And we saw that this is kilogram meter per second squared times second. So you get this as minus one. The unit, the SI unit for impulse is the same as momentum. Is it? Yes, it's the same. So mass times velocity is the same as force times time. Okay. So both are vector quantities. Okay, so momentum is P equals to MV and we know that if there is a change in momentum, we need to have that delta somewhere over here as well. So the delta can be in the form of mass, which means that your mass is changing or it can be in the change of velocity. But of course, we're not weird, we're not alien. So our mass does not change over time unless, I mean, over time in a short period of time, our mass does not change but our velocity can change. So that delta should go to the V. So delta P is equal to M delta V, or you can expand this to become M, <coughs> MV1 minus MV2 or MU minus MV. So the change in momentum is represented by this guy, but typically we will use this one instead of the change in mass. So the rate of change of momentum is given by so we have change in momentum. Tak habis lagi cerita ni. We have the change in momentum. And then if I wanted to talk about the rate of change of momentum, I need to include the 
delta t sign over here below the p remember if i say the rate when when they are talking about the rate of something you have to have time as the denominator so this also gets a denominator so delta p over delta t is equal to m delta v over delta t so this is if we are assuming a constant mass this is if both are not constant Okay, so kita tengok equation ni, so no worries. So Newton's second law of motion states that the rate of change of momentum of an object, so rate ada over time, eh? rate of change of momentum of an object is proportional to the force acting on the object. So this is the equation delta P over delta T is equal to F. Therefore, if we put this guy, if we put the time next to our force, we can, it looks familiar, it looks like impulse. So we can say that the change in P, at the point the change in momentum is equal to impulse. Okay, so how did we get this F? How did we get this F? Tengok balik sini. Look at this guy. Delta P over, let me copy this. Where did we get that F? Tiba-tiba je equal to F kan? So it came from here. So delta P equals to M delta V. If you guys remember, delta V over delta T gives us acceleration. So mass times acceleration gives us force F. This is MA or this is equal to F. Okay. So kita ada derived delta P equals to M delta V. And if we put um, T on delta P ataupun <coughs> ataupun kita boleh letak P sorry kita letak T uh, on this side we need to put T on the other side as well so we would have delta P over delta T is equal to M delta V over delta T macam mana datang delta T ni tiba-tiba um, we can put it if we want to know the rate so kalau saya letak kat sini saya kena letak on the other side as well sama macam saya cerita pasal delta I have P P is equal to MV. I want to know, hey, what's the change in P? I put the delta here. So I have to put the delta here as well. It balances out. And it also cancels out. So it works. Sama juga kat sini. How did we have the delta T? I put it inside there because I wanted to know what is the rate of change of momentum. So when I put the delta T, I have to put the delta T on the other side as well. Kita yang letak kat situ. Okay, so when I have delta V over delta T that is equal to acceleration, the change in velocity over time is acceleration. Kita belajar in chapter 2. So this gives me MA. Delta P over delta T is MA. MA is equal to F. So this is where this equation came from. And then we move this delta T to the other side. We would get delta P as F delta T and this is impulse. So impulse is the change in momentum. Mm, yeah, okay. Okay, so we go on to our problem solving strategy of impulse and momentum. Okay, so example 5.1. I think this is in your module book as well. So a tennis player receives a shot with a ball, with a ball of mass, let me write that down somewhere, kilogram, traveling horizontally at 50 meter per second. So, dear receive, eh? receive, I am the tennis player, I am receiving a ball. So, it comes at me. I'm receiving a ball, it comes at me, and it is it is traveling towards me at 50 meter per second, and I return, I return the shot with a ball traveling horizontally at 4 meter per second, 40 meter per second in the opposite direction. Mula-mula ada orang baling kat saya, 50 meter per second. Saya baling balik dekat dia, 40 meter per second. What is the impulse delivered to the ball by the racket? So, just let's just remember the equation. Impulse is equal to force times T. Or, impulse is equal to delta P. Which equation can we use here? What, which equation? Is it the first one or the second one? 
Delta P. Delta P. How do we use delta P to fit in with this problem? What is the equation for P? M P P equal to M V. Change of y. P equals to M V. Okay, P equals to M V. If I have the delta here, how does my equation become? Delta M V. Delta M V. Okay, P delta. Eh, sorry, P equals to delta. Sorry, delta P equals to M delta V. So I put that. Susah nak sebut benda ni. Delta P equals to M delta V. So if we have that delta, this delta has to exist. If I don't have a delta in my P, I don't have a delta in my MV. So this is very important to take note of. Eh? If you have one delta over here and you don't, don't put the delta in the MV, it is wrong. It is wrong. Eh? Okay, so let's continue with this uh, problem. So delta P equals to delta M, sorry, M delta V. Our mass is constant, so we are talking about the ball. What impulse is delivered to the ball? So this is the mass of the ball, m equals 0 0.06, and delta v is v final minus v initial. So v final is, what is our v final here? Is it 40 or 50? 40. 40. <laughs> our v final and our v initial is 50. Kena tengok, we have to look at the problem carefully and identify which one is the initial and which one is the final as always that we have done previously. Linear kinematic pun kena tengok, sini pun kena tengok. Okay, so this would give me an answer. Oh my god. This would give me an answer of 40 minus 50. Negative 0 0.6. Negative 0 0.6. Thank you. Negative 0 0.6. This is 10 times 0 0.06. 0 0.6. Betul. So the unit, what about the unit here? What is the unit for impulse? Newton second. Newton second, yes. Newton second or kilogram, mm, kilogram meter per second for the momentum. Kilogram meter per second. Boleh juga. So minus 0 0.6 newton second. What work does the ball do? Okay, so work when your equation is W equals to F times distance. Do we need to use this equation? What work does the ball do? So it doesn't give us the time, so we can't really find the force. How can we do this one? What work does the ball do? So let's see. You guys forgot about chapter four? <laughs> so it is change in kinetic energy is equal to work. Dah lupa dah chapter four. Okay. So work is the change in energy. So what is happening here? It is a horizontal problem. Therefore, we are only changing in our kinetic energy. The gravitational potential energy does not change. So we are only focusing on KE. So senang je lah sebenarnya. So work done is equal to KE final minus KE initial. 1 over 2 M. This is V final. 40 that we talked about just now. Minus 1 over 2 M. V initial. And you get that as minus 27 joules. It is a minus work. The work done is a minus energy. It is a minus work done. Ataupun it is a negative work done. Therefore, we know that the ball is losing energy to somewhere. But we don't know where it, where it goes. Okay. Maybe friction uh, with the racket. Maybe uh, friction with the other player. Maybe air drag. Who knows? But the ball is losing energy. Okay. So is that okay with everyone? So we learned about impulse. This is um, how we calculate for impulse. We use the change in momentum. And then if we want to know what is the work done, we use our change in Ke is equal to work done. And this is not um, exclusive, eh, maksudnya. Remember, I talked about, I told you guys about the work energy theorem and I told you about Ke, e, change in Ke equals to W. Sometimes your W can be change in Ke 
last change in uh, UG. Benda macam tu, eh? So you can have this addition over here. Boleh jadi. So yeah, I'm just telling you. Benda ni tak. This equation is not. It, it can exist in other forms lah. What I'm trying to say here. This is the work energy theorem. Yes. But this equation also exists. It's not called the work energy theorem. This is called the work energy theorem. But this is also mathematically correct and also physically correct. So work is a change in energy in KE, change in UG. Boleh juga. So ada soalan tak? I know that was a little bit confusing. Saya masuk balik chapter 4 sikit sebab korang ada web assign. Nanti kena tengok. Okay, so that was KE and also impulse. So that was easy, right? Kita dah belajar. What is this? Oh, saya dah pernah lukis benda ni. Hmm. Yeah, sama je. Okay, so we move on to the conservation of linear momentum. Or setengah jam. Uh, so Newton's second law of motion states that the rate of change of momentum, we immediately know. Kita baca ni je, kita dah tahu rate is over time. Change in momentum is delta P. So we're talking about delta P over delta T is proportional to the net force on the object. So F is equal to delta P over delta T. So we know this already. So if F is equal to zero, if F is equal to zero, zero, then dp dt is also equal to zero. So now why did they change the delta P over delta T to dp dt? Like I mentioned to you before, the delta tells us it is the change and it is inclusive of small changes and big changes. But when we are talking about D, dp dt, we are talking about small changes, which we use in our integration. Ataupun, de sorry, derivation, derivation. So D is a small change. Delta is inclusive for both small and big changes. So bolehlah tulis delta as D. It would mean the same thing. Okay, but mathemat mathematically, korang kena figure out lah nak kena pakai mana. I mean, in your maths class, in physics is lebih kurang je. Okay, so that is dpdt is also equal to zero. It means that there is no change in its momentum or the momentum is constant. Is that true? Let's see. So F is equal to zero. They said, they told us that momentum is constant. Let's see. So MV minus, sorry, MU, sorry, it's MV. MV minus MU over delta T. If my V is equal to U, if my V is equal to U at upon constant velocity, this guy would cancel out each other and they would become zero. So it means that MV is equal to MV as well. Lah. V equals to U, MV is equal to MU. Sorry. So the momentum is constant. MV dengan MU ni, value dia sama. Tak berubah. So there is no change in momentum. Therefore, change in momentum is equal to zero. Therefore, force is zero. Ataupun vice versa. Force is equal to zero, O. Oh. So change in momentum is zero. It goes both ways. Eh? Just remember this equation. If this guy is zero, this guy is zero. This guy is zero, force is zero. So the total linear momentum in an isolated system is always conserved. Now, what is isolated system? It is a system that is shielded from external forces. Uh, when we're talking about, um, apa lah? I really can't come up with an example right now. Saya tengah mengantuk. So the isolated system means no external force is acting on the system. Um, contohnya macam, we're talking about kinetic energy of a car, right? We're talking about the kinetic energy of the car moving. And I am not assuming that this car is going to slow down because of the incoming traffic, kan ada traffic light ke, uh, ataupun ada orang pedestrian lalu juga ke, macam berlanggar ke apa ke, so that, those things tak ada, kita assume, kita punya system ni, kita punya environment ni, ideal, the car can move and it is moving happily without any um, external forces ataupun orang yang kacau dia, okay, so that is what it means. Isolated system. Terlindung dari benda-benda yang kita tak nak. Okay, so that is the definition. The total linear momentum, 
total linear momentum in an isolated system is always conserved, just like energy. It is always conserved. So the principle of conservation of linear momentum can be applied in two colliding objects. What is, exactly is linear momentum? Linear momentum is P equals to mv. So this guy is conserved, just like energy. And it can be applied in two colliding objects or the explosion of objects into pieces. So the initial total linear momentum would be equal to the final total linear momentum. So if I have mv1, mv1 would be equal to mv2. But if I have two objects that are colliding, I would have mv1 for object 1, mv2 for object 2, and this would be equal to mu1 plus mu2. This is the initial velocity of the objects, and this is the final velocity of the objects. This is the conservation of momentum for both. So, bila kita cakap conservation of momentum, kita cakap pasal mv ni lah. We use this mv. But each object will have their own mv, will have their own momentum. Let's say we have a ball, ball A and ball B. This, they are both moving together, kalau together, they are both moving to the right. So, this is the momentum, sorry, this is initial again. This is the momentum for ball A and this is the momentum for ball B. And then they collide, lepas dorang berlanggar, lepas dorang berlanggar, dorang um, move um, away, I mean, they still move after the collision. So the momentum after the collision will be represented by these two terms. We will, we will talk more on this. Okay, so the impulsive force on an object normally delivered in a very short time, yes, because we saw that the egg falling on the ground immediately cracked and that cracking was because of the impulsive force. Thus, the average force is large and causes a large effect. So in everyday life, we can say that we can reduce effect of impulsive force by increasing the time of contact. So for example, airbag, seat belt, and also cushion. So when we are colliding, when we are colliding, the airbag serves to increase the time of collision. Bila kita langgar, bantal tu, bantal. When we langgar that airbag, we don't immediately stop. We don't immediately stop. But our face, dia terbenam dalam bantal. Cubalah korang kempuk kepala kat bantal ke. Janganlah, jangan kuat-kuat. Buat selesa je. Kempuk kepala kat bantal. You will find out that you do not stop immediately. Ada masa sikit lah. Compared to if you head bang yourself on the wall but don't do that so when you head bang yourself on the wall you immediately stop so that is the short time and when we have a short time we would have high force sakit lah and when we head bang ourselves into a pillow the time taken is longer for us to stop so this is the same um, physics applied here you have that airbag to increase the time of impact Sama juga macam seat belt. When you are um, when you are colliding, don't hopefully not. When you are colliding, that seat belt grabs you, so you don't immediately stop. So ada macam masa sebelum hempuk kepala dekat um, seat depan ke. That seat belt extends the time. Okay. If that if that seat belt is not there, you would immediately tercampak kan? Tercampak because of inertia. So the seat belt stops you. You can stop that. They're increasing the time. Lah. Okay, so that is how it works. Airbag, seat belt, cushion, they are all serving to increase the time. Okay, so I think this study is very um, interesting. Lah. Okay, so impulse and collision. The impulsive force uh, on an object is normally delivered in a very short time. This is the same thing. Okay, so we have three types of collision. So we have elastic. We have inelastic and we have actual collision, whereby the collision falls between elastic and perfectly inelastic collision. But we will talk about elastic and inelastic only for our syllabus. Actually, ada macam banyak komponen sikit lah. So we will talk about the simple one, elastic and also inelastic. And another one is perfectly inelastic or we can say completely inelastic. 
It means the same thing. Eh, salah salah je. Completely inelastic. Perfectly inelastic is the same as completely inelastic. So elastic number one, inelastic number two, number three is perfectly inelastic. So elastic collision, both momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. So our mv and our ke, or tapo one over two mv squared. Okay, are both conserved. We will find out how to write this equation later. In elastic, momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not conserved. Most likely, we will lose energy uh, when we uh, during the final final motion. Initially, kita tak lose energy, but the final kinetic energy kita akan lose energy lah. Of course lah, sebab takkan kita start with less energy and then we gain. That doesn't make sense. When we collide, we will lose some energy most of the time. So when we collide, so the Ke initial will be greater than Ke final. So this is when kinetic energy is not conserved. Mv1 is equal to Mv2. This one is equal to 1 over 2 Mv2 squared. I should label this as final and initial. It would be confusing. So kita akan ada dua object nanti. So this is initial and this is final. This is equal. This means that the momentum is conserved. 1 over 2 mv squared. mvi is equal to mvf. 1 over 2 mvf squared. So kinetic energy is conserved. But when it is not conserved, kei is greater than kef. But momentum is conserved. Well, mvi is still equal to mv final. And then for perfectly inelastic, kita akan cakap kemudian nanti. Okay. So elastic collision, both momentum and kinetic energy is conserved. Yeah, let me go back. So for both collision, our momentum is always conserved. Always conserved. Momentum is always conserved. The only thing that you need to remember is either Ke conserved ke tak. Elastic Ke conserved. Inelastic Ke does not, is not conserved. So dua-dua collision, momentum conserved eh. Okay, so elastic collision, both momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. The equation is like this. We have two balls here. So this is the momentum for the first ball. And this is the momentum for the second ball. After colliding, this is, kita buat collide sikit. Then after colliding, they are still traveling with some V. So this is the U1. This is U2. This is V1 and this is V2. After colliding, they are still moving, but at different velocities. So this is MV, M1, V1, representing the momentum after collision. And this is M2, V2, the momentum of this ball after collision. So M1, U2, plus M2, U2 is equal to M1, V1, plus M2, U, V2. And then for the conservation of kinetic energy, sama juga 1 over 2 m1 u1 squared using the same values. Value dia kena sama. Kat sini pun sama. But in the form of kinetic energy equation. Then we have m1 v1 1 over 2 m1 v1 squared 1 over 2 m1 over 2 m2 v2 squared. Okay. So panjang sikit equation dia but it's not, it's not hard lah. You just have to plug in the equation correctly. And you have to know what is the velocity. So for inelastic collision, momentum is conserved. Okay, so both collision momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not. So conservation of momentum, this is the exactly same question as before. But for the conservation of kinetic energy, the Ke initial is greater than Ke final. So typically, we will just use this to double check our equation. It cannot solve our equation. Kita boleh double check je. So kita check pakai, let's say dia tanya, what is the velocity of ball number ball number one after collision? So using this equation, you can find out what is V1 provided that you know what is this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. So you can solve for V1. But this equation, if they ask you what is V1 and you have all the values, you still can't solve it because it is not equal. So tak tahu dia besar banyak mana. So this equation is only going to help you to check your answer. If indeed that our Ke initial is greater than Ke final, 
so everything makes sense. But it won't help you to solve what is V1. Okay, so it's just there to help you. You don't have to write it if you don't want to. And then we have the perfectly inelastic collision, the third one. What does it mean? Momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not. And there's an N here. The two objects stick together after collision. So their final velocities are the same. So perfectly inelastic collision ni best sikit sebab kita punya mass bergabung. So senanglah kita punya hidup. So kita ada M1 U1 plus M2 U2 referring to the momentum of these balls. And when they collide, they stick together and move together. Boleh bayangkan ada situasi ni macam tu tak? Let's say ada bullet. Bullet tu tembak uh, bongkah kayu. After tembak, they both move together because now the bullet is inside the... What do you call it? Eh? Bongkah kayu? Sekejap. Cannot run. Sekejap. Okay, sorry for that. I didn't go in. Okay, so after collision uh, of the bullet and the bunga kayu, I don't know what is it called in English. So they are when you shoot a bullet inside this bunga kayu, what happens is that the bullet is going to be inside the bunga kayu, and after collision, this is called collision, and eh? walaupun bullet to tembak. After collision, they move together. Sebab ada baki. Wooden block. Yes, thank you. So, friend. So, it's called a wooden block. So, they move together. So, there, therefore, if they move together, they would have the same velocity. And the mass pun kena berubah lah. M1 plus M2. Mass of the bullet and the mass of the wooden block. Okay. All right, and then we have the conservation of kinetic energy that is not conserved. So this only serves to help us um, check the answer if you want. Okay, so in head-on collision, so the collisions that we talked about is called head-on. Head-on maksudnya, when you collide, they are still in the x-axis. Nampak ya? Kat sini semua x-axis. Tapi yang sebenarnya, when we collide two objects, they can either move this way or this way and it is not exactly x axis right it has some x and y you thought this was not going to be a vector but it is so kita akan belajar components later on juga for collision so collision head on adalah referring to one axis the ones that we talked about this is linear this is kita akan assume it is happening in one axis ataupun let's just call it as x axis so our life is easy so this is all x axis eh tak ada komponen kat sini. So senanglah hidup kita. But akan ada collision yang ada dua komponen x and y. So let's talk about that later lah. Okay, so two mass A and B, do we have time? We have 10 minutes. Let me see. Panjang ke tak soalan ni? Two mass A and B of 2 kg and 1.5. Okay, move on a smooth surface in the same direction with speeds of five. Why am I? Dengar tak bunyi tu? My kid is playing some, some game, I don't know. Okay, so this is kilogram, two kilogram and 1.5. So U is three and this is five. Five meter per second eh? Okay. Calculate the velocity of A and B after collision if the collision is completely inelastic. So this is an inelastic. What does inelastic mean? It means that momentum is conserved and but the Ke is not conserved. The in not conserved is not conserved. Okay, so let's use this equation. After collision, apa apa akan berlaku? Uh, we want to know what is the speed of these two guys after collision. Okay. So, kita nak tahu what is V completely, sorry. There's a word here. Completely inelastic. They can stick together. So, after collision, they move together. Dah kahwin. So, dia akan bergerak. 
with a single velocity. So this was u1 and this was u2. And after collision, this word completely inelastic means that they stick together and move together. Okay, so let's do this. So m1, mu1, m1, u1 plus m1, u, sorry, m2, u2 is equal to m1 plus m2. The mass are sticking together, therefore they have the same velocity. So m1 is 2 kilogram, u is 3 M2 is 1.5 and U is 5 and the mass we know is 2 plus 1.5 and the V we just need to solve. So it's easy, right? Just using the equation, remembering which equation to use actually. 2 times 3 plus 1.5 times 5 divided by 3.5. So I will get my velocity after collision is 3.86 meter per second. So this guy, bermula dia bergerak 3 meter per second and 5. After collision, they both move together by 3.86 meter per second. So you can make an experiment with this. What happens when you collide? Does the velocity decrease? Does it increase? Who knows? So boleh try. Guna equation ni. Okay, so I think that is it for our class today. Nanti kita akan buat lagi examples after this. Did we get the same answer? Yeah. Lebih kurang. Okay, so next class we're talking we're talking about oblique collision which is uh, the non-linear, bukan non-linear lah. Uh, the two axis collision. Okay. So take care everyone. Have a great rest of the day. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Bye-bye. Jangan lupa web Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Bye-bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.